I have been asked to produce a video on the effects of a pyramid on agriculture. I'm not an expert on either subject. On the 4th of November 1949, a radio engineer called Carol Dubel turned up at the patent office in Czechoslovakia with a patent application for a cardboard pyramid which kept razor blades sharp. He was told to get lost and not come back until he could present a theory as to why a pyramid could do that. Undeterred, Carroll worked on a theory for years, and he was eventually awarded a patent in 1959, not because his theory was so good, but because the chief patent officer took a pyramid home and tested it, only to find that it did exactly what Carroll said it did. Carroll estimated that without the pyramid, a razor blade would provide five shaves, but with the pyramid, the blade would give fifty shaves. This is interesting as it confirms with an independent test that a pyramid shape causes an effect, even if it's not possible to say with absolute certainty what that effect is and how the pyramid shape manipulates that energy. Thomas Treuger has a good deal of experience in using pyramids and he has even managed to get electrical power output from a pyramid for 30 days continuously. Surprisingly, he recommends that the pyramid be positioned with a corner pointing towards magnetic north, which is most unusual because most other people think that one of the base edges should face north, which is 45 degrees from, wo from what Thomas says. Four solid pieces like this, joined together to make a properly proportioned pyramid. That's a piece of the base 20 units wide and 19 units along the sloping faces. If you want to do it with a perpendicular, the perpendicular is 16.18 units in the centre of your 20 unit base. The Great Pyramid of Egypt was built with, the base, with base edges facing exactly north-south. Pyramids are not the only shape which has a major effect, and a cone shape is also effective, and it has the advantage that there's no question of its orientation when you're using one. There's no need for all the pyramid faces to be solid, and in fact it's recommended that no, not all faces should be solid, and even just the sloping edges can work on their own. So what can a pyramid do? Well, actually, nothing except for directing and possibly focusing the zero-point energy field, sometimes called orgon. Perhaps the question should be, what effects can be caused by using a pyramid? The answer has to include that it boosts the life force energy in people, animals and plants. As seen from above, Thomas Treuger has got a continuous electrical output from a period pyramid. However, Low-tech investigators have noted that an effect caused by a pyramid may be repeated nine times in a row, but then, inexplicably, one day it will not work. However, what has been found repeatedly is, first, living things placed under a pyramid shape are boosted in health and growth. An example of this is given on the website pointed to here, which is MotherEarthNews.com, where James Brock of Texas reports on tests which he has run on a group of rabbits. It would be incredibly easy to fake this kind of information, so you need to make up your own mind and ideally run some tests of your own. James states that he built a pyramid-shaped hutch of timber with four-foot-long sloping edges. He also built a rectangular hutch. Each of the hutches had a transparent door, and he then borrowed eight rabbits. Uh, the rabbits were about 20 days old and taken from two different litters, and he placed them in matched groups of four in each hutch. He fed them equally and weighed them every four days. By the end of the experiment, 57 days later, the rabbits which had been housed in the pyramid hutch weighed an average of 46.5 ounces, 
compared to an average of 34.5 ounces for those in the rectangular hutch. That is, the rabbits in the pyramid hutch were nearly 35% heavier, and side by side they looked like this. James presents his results in the form of two graphs. He does it like this. The female in the pyramid hutch is the thick red line. The female in the rectangular hutch is the blue line. The male in the rectangular, sorry, the male in the pyramid hutch is this lighter red line. And the male in the rectangular hutch is this lighter blue line. The same again for 80, th this graph here is for 75 day old rabbits. This chart here is for 80 day old rabbits. And you can see that the pyramid lines are close together and the rectangular hutch lines are close together. But they have a considerable difference because for instance, uh, this group here, um, has a weight of 30 ounces on average, while the ones in the pyramid have got about 38 pounds or 38 ounces in weight. James invites you to run this test for yourself to verify that th this does indeed occur. Secondly, pyramid users also state that they find the following effects on a consistent basis provided that the pyramid is kept away from strong magnetic fields, so do not put a pyramid on top of a TV set or a refrigerator. First of all, fruit is preserved. When a purchase of fresh fruit or vegetables is made, if they are placed under a pyramid for about an hour, and then stored as they normally would be stored, it is said that they stay fresh for at least twice as long as they normally would, and the flavour is improved. It's believed that unhealthful microorganisms are killed by the pyramid. If fruit and vegetables are kept indefinitely under a pyramid, they eventually dry up instead of rotting. The second effect is that food quality is enhanced. If frozen meat, fish or fowl is thawed out under a pyramid, the quality of the meat is said to be noticeably improved. Next coffee quality is improved. If a cup of coffee is left under a pyramid for about 20 minutes, it's said to gain a much more mellow flavour. Leaving ground coffee or a jar of instant coffee under a pyramid overnight is said to change the coffee so that the coffee made from it is of a much higher quality. Next, a glass of wine placed under a pyramid for 20 minutes is said to undergo a distinct change with great improvement seen in both the taste and the aroma. Other alcoholic drinks are also said to be improved by the process. The next effect that they report is that a 20 to 30 minute treatment of fruit juices is said to reduce the acidic bite of the drink and in many cases alter the colour of the juice. Also, any item pickled in vinegar such as olives and pickles gain a greatly enhanced natural flavour and are greatly mellowed by the process. The rapid growth of mould on cheddar cheese can be overcome by the cheese being kept under a pyramid at normal room temperature. It's recommended that the cheese is wrapped in plastic to reduce the rate at which the cheese dries out. Next, rice and wheat can be kept in open jars under a 12 inch open wire frame pyramid for at least four months without any form of deterioration or infestation by flies or insects as they are repelled by the energy inside the pyramid. A test was run outdoors with a pyramid with a six foot base and which had food placed in the centre to attract ants. It was found that ants heading for the food followed a curved path out of the pyramid without ever reaching the food. Next, water left under a pyramid is altered. Cut flowers placed in it tend to last 30% longer than normal, while growing plants watered with it grow more strongly and are hardier. 
The water appears to hold the energy indefinitely. A glassful takes 20 minutes. A quart, which is two pints, takes one hour. And larger amounts should be left overnight. Animals giving the choice of pyramid water or untreated water almost always choose the treated water. In the 1940s, Vern Cameron of America discovered that the beneficial pyramid energy could be transmitted. He placed a pyramid at each end of a row of plants, connected a wire to the apex of each pyramid, and ran the wire underneath the plants with a clump of steel wool on the wire underneath each plant. The pyramids were aligned north-south, and he found even better results were obtained if the row of plants was also aligned in a north-south direction. Might remark at this point that wool is a much better carrier of this energy than wire is. Fourthly, there are reports of instances where dogs suffering from old age, lameness and hair loss have been cured and rejuvenated in about six weeks by the use of a pyramid. Now we come on to Les Brown. Les Brown experimented extensively with pyramids and related devices. It should be stressed at this point that while various facts have been observed, the effect caused by a pyramid is not fully at this, understood at this time, and no laws, so-called, have yet been deduced. We have to work on the basis of, this is what has been done, and these were the results. Because of this, the following extract from the work of the late Les Brown is reproduced here, and you must decide for yourself if what he says is true, and whether or not it might be worth your while trying out some of what he says. In conducting pyramid experiments, you should look daily, he says, for signs of change, and note them meticulously. And above all, be patient. Don't plant a seed one day, and expect to have a plant six feet tall the very next day. A plant takes just as long to develop inside a pyramid as it does outside, but in time you will see the tremendous difference in size. Also, don't keep moving plants around inside your pyramid during an experiment. Leave pots stationary so that you can see what the results are. You can make your own pyramids. They can be constructed entirely from inexpensive materials. Cardboard, wire, plywood, or anything rigid enough to retain the pyramid shape will do. The pyramid does not necessarily have to be solid. In experiments, just the outline shape is sufficient, provided that it's joined at all corners and at the apex. Remember that with all types of pyramid, positioning is all important. One of the square base sides must point northwards, towards magnetic north. Use a compass to determine the direction of magnetic north, and seven pyramids, correctly orientated and stacked on top of one another, will produce increased energy, cell activity and growth. Using pyramids, I sincerely believe that I can grow 36 times more and better plants in a given area than any farmer or market gardener can in the same area using conventional methods. Les further says that all four sides are put together. When you do that, you must have a pyramid which is leaning at 51 degrees, 51 minutes, 14 seconds. If you grow a plant inside a pyramid, it absorbs energy at a high intensity, and so the result is enormous growth. When this is applied to vegetables and fruit, the plants, as well as their products, are immensely oversized. My own experiments have convinced me that this energy creates a special reaction in the living cells of plants resulting in larger blooms, larger leaves, and larger fruits on whatever plants are propagated within the pyramid. The normal life cycle of lettuce, for instance, from seed to maturity, is six to eight weeks. Grown under a pyramid, the life cycle is still the same, but the plant is considerably larger. If you allow the vine type of tomato to mature to six or seven trusses, 
under a pyramid while simultaneously allowing an identical plant to do the same outside the pyramid, giving both the plants the same feeding and watering, a startling difference in yield occurs. I should mention that if you put your outside plant too near the pyramid, it will reach for and receive some of the pyramid's energy, so keep it well away to get a fair comparison. The outside tomatoes would weigh out at approximately 10 to 14 pounds per plant, while the plant grown in the pyramid will produce between 50 and 60 pounds of tomatoes. Not every type of plant grown under a pyramid will produce this increase. This is the average which less has come to expect from tomatoes. A few more averages which Les has obtained repeatedly were lettuce, two to three times larger than average, beans, 25 inches long by one and a quarter inches wide, cabbage, when controls were three pounds each, the pyramid grown ones were 12 to 13 pounds per head, radishes that would normally be the size of a quarter were four inches in diameter, Controlled cucumbers that averaged 14 inches in length and weighed up to 1 pound normally were 21 inches long and weighed up to 4 pounds when grown in a pyramid. Energized air in the pyramid also appears to repel small insects, so there's no need to use pesticides within its glass walls. Pest-free plants grow to maturity inside a pyramid with none of the setbacks which plants subject to normal attack from pests suffer in the garden outside. This also means that pyramid-grown vegetables need no washing upon harvesting. The mere appearance of such plants is more appetizing than that of those grown normally. Greens are more vivid, and many leaves have a sheen which is noticeably absent from plants in kitchen gardens. An egg broken out of its shell and left inside a pyramid will gradually congeal and become like plastic as the pyramid energy works on its cells harmlessly. The cells do not die nor induce putrefaction. After a period of weeks or months, these congealed eggs can be reconstituted in water to the point where they can be eaten with complete safety and they taste even more delicious than eggs prepared in the usual way. One peculiar phenomenon which I have observed under my large pyramid, says Les, is the formation of dew on the plants inside it. This happens early in the morning. During all of my years of experience with greenhouses, I never noticed dew forming on any plants in conventional greenhouses. This dew dissipates gently as the sun grows stronger, exactly as it would outside. Also, after a recent thunderstorm, my pyramid cucumbers grew two to two and a half inches in a matter of hours. This is a picture of Les's pyramid uh, with glassed faces. He says, I built a pyramid purely for search purposes. For larger scale production, a pyramid which is much greater in size would be needed. When building the prototype, I encountered and overcame virtually all the problems one can expect to meet in a construction of this type. Building a pyramid is nothing like building a house. And while a slight difference in measurement can be overcome when building a house, it's not possible to make a mistake in a pyramid and just carry on building. The particular piece containing the error must be pulled out and replaced correctly, as any mistake is transferred all the way around the pyramid. My test pyramid is 30 feet high at the peak. The sides from base to corner, um, from base corner to the peak of the structure, measure 44 feet 4.5 inches, with a base edge length of 46 feet ten and a half inches. It contains two additional floors above the ground level and the sum of the areas of these two floors is equal to or greater than that of the ground floor. Thus the two additional floors virtually double the growing area. My first floor is 12 feet above the ground and there's a reason for this. 
I calculated that when the sun was at its highest point, the first floor would have to be 12 feet high to allow the sun to shine on to the back northern edge of the ground floor. The 12 foot high uh, floor was perfect, but not absolutely necessary, as there are as many plants that grow well in shade as there are plants that prefer the sun. In future, my pyramid floors will all be 8 feet apart, and I will put my sun-loving plants in the southern half and my shade-loving plants in the back northern half. By placing the floors at 8 foot intervals, there is much, there is much more growing area. With floors inside a pyramid, the higher up the floor, the higher up the temperature is. For example, if the ground floor is at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, then the second floor would be at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and the third floor would be about 105 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And each of the higher floors would also have higher humidity. The ground floor is perfect for such crops as radishes, lettuce, carrots, beets, tomatoes, etc. The second floor is ideal for cucumbers, squash, peppers, and plants which like it hotter and more humid than the ground floor. The top floor can be used for lemons, oranges, figs, and especially orchids. The pyramid draws in its own water on the ground floor. I have never had to water that level, which is built directly on the ground. It never draws too much or too little water, always just the right amount for growth. Naturally, I have to pump water to the upper floors, but because the ground floor provides its own water supply, at least half of my pyramid is watered automatically for no cost. I grow right in the ground on which the pyramid stands, but upstairs I have placed wooden planting troughs all around the floors, leaving room to walk, and I grow plants in these troughs. It's a major job getting soils of the upper floors initially, but it's only a, a one-time task. The troughs are 14 inches wide, 16 inches deep, and have a bottom. Space in the pyramids is used to the utmost. At the perimeter of the low areas, I plant the kind of plants that need little headroom, and then I plant the bigger crops towards the middle. This is a matter of common sense, but using vine-type tomatoes and stringing them up one can work better between the rows, and if the lower leaves of the tomato plants are removed, there is a sufficient space to grow lettuce, cabbage, or any low-lying crop in between the tomato plants. The trusses may be left on the tomatoes, as they will not shade the low-lying plants. To ensure a steady supply of food, it's wise to plant only a few plants of each variety at intervals which means that in the beginning it will take several weeks to reap a full harvest, but after that there will be continuous yield. By planting in such a manner, the grower will reap about six full crops each year. This method applies only to an enclosed pyramid, which would also need heating in the winter. The means of heating is up to the individual. Personally, I use a wood-burning stove. That is because I have a supply of wood, um, and uh, however, a wood and oil combination is best, because it allows somebody to be away for a couple of days when necessary, and then if the wood fire gets low, the oil burner takes over. In addition to food growth, the pyramid also has application in food preservation. I have read statistics which state that 40% of all food grown in my ho home country of Canada is lost to putrefac putrefaction, whether at the place of storage, in transport, in wholesale or retail, or finally in the home. Regardless of how this spoilage occurs, this state of affairs can be remedied. The energy of the pyramid which grows plants so amazingly well, can also be used for the mummification of food, which can be dehydrated and kept in storage for an indefinite period without losing any of its taste or nutritional properties. There are absolutely no ill effects on any food stored in a pyramid. 
In fact, in many instances, it's far better when reconstituted than it was in the first place. It has the water taken out of it, but it also repels bacteria, and as a result, nothing will rot in a pyramid. For instance, I cannot make a compost heap inside my pyramid. I have to do it outside. Otherwise, the ingredients in the compost all remain in good shape and will not break down. The grain grown in Manitoba today is a direct descendant of the grain found in the Great Pyramid, grain that had been there for centuries and which it kept perfectly. My pyramid is made from rough sawn, sawn timber that is not planed all over. It, the timber has been cut on or near my property and milled by a neighbour, but it is not necessary for pyramids to be made of wood. They can may be made of any rigid material which will support permanent glazing. Cardboard, strong wire, sheet steel or metal angle iron, logs, anything which will not curve and which can be measured precisely and fitted. Pyramids do not need to have solid faces. For many uses, open-sided shapes will do, so long as all the corners are joined and the angles are correct. My present pyramid is made of timber and covered with heavy gauge plastic sheet. Future ones will be sheathed in fiberglass, acrylic or glass. They will be closed pyramids solely because I propose to grow food during the depths of Canada's frigid winters. My pyramid frame is built mainly of wood, measuring 2 inches by 4 inches and 2 inches by 8 inches, rough sawn. Pyramids can be built any size, as long as their proportions are correct. There's a video of Les Brown lecturing on the web, and it's at this particular uh, reference point here. These notes are called um, pyramid.pdf and the download link is given along with the download link for the ebook. Get a lot more concentration around this edge out here where the flux is coming off and it's being flattened by the other field. Again, our bottom still looks very good and homogeneous across this area. Earlier in this video, I mentioned our magnet stacking technique. This is something we developed, I guess it was like 15 years ago, and I developed this because of looking at what the magnets do as they go from one stack to another. And when I looked at this, I noticed that just like we've already seen in the flux patterns, we're able to see that the magnetism wants to loop on these corners. Out here, it is going to form a circular loop and you pretty much lose that. So there's a set distance that I like to come in, and I've tested this to come up with the right distance to try and optimize this. And we come into this point, and now the flux that's in this region that was a very high, intense concentration of flux says it had rather travel through another piece of magnet material than circulating in air. So we see a lot of this flux will loop in and go into this piece here. Now it shrunk the surface area. Now, the flux that's out here will once again loop and go into this one. And each layer is reducing the cross-sectional area substantially by a different amount each time, all the way down till we get this three millimeter square surface area. And on the three millimeter square surface area, we're reading over 9,900 gauss. We've taken it from a magnet that had 5,830 gauss in the center. But by adding these stacking magnets, as you'll see, when we put the gauss meter on this, we are able to get 9,930 gauss. That is just 70 gauss short of a Tesla. You can push this that weighs about one pound into having you a very, very small one Tesla field at the top of it. And this is a technique that many people have used and many of our customers have used when, we, when they need a really high static magnetic field in a very small area, we use this stacking technique to really help push that flux up to where they need it to be without needing an electromagnet or a superconducting magnet to just get up to that range. Now, we have taken this to even higher levels. 
Our last thing we want to look at in the pyramids is looking at our giant C magnet. This is something where we used two pyramids with two large magnets and an assembly to put it together with the stacking magnets and we we're able to push this to about 2.5, 2.6 Tesla with one static magnetic assembly. And we've mentioned this and it's got its own entire video where we talk about this particular magnet. But I wanted to just show you this is how we have learned to continue to change and challenge ourselves with this pyramidal design and focusing the magnetic flux and the basics that we understand how it all comes together. We're also driven by all of our customers who keep asking for various applications. They keep contacting us. Can you make a magnet that does this? Can you make a magnet that does this? And at Super Magnet Man we always try very hard to get where they can. We get as creative as we can with both pyramids, haulbacks, and a wide variety of other magnets to help you understand how magnets work and for us to try and help you achieve your goal for your application. So if you have applications for magnets that require high intensity fields, that require a focused field, or require things like this, don't hesitate to call us at Super Magnet Man. We look forward to helping you develop a solution for your application. Thanks again for watching. Look forward to you with the next video coming up soon.